let them talk if they want to. And welcome to Let Them Talk. I'm Paul DiRienzo and my guest, Jamel Mims, who's going to talk about, well, we, we just was going, we were going over it. I guess we're going to talk about stop and frisk, the effect that that has on people here in New York City, and the, the effect that the Judge uh, Shira Scheinland's decision might have on the stop and frisk reality that exists for mostly African American and, and Latino males in the city. Uh, the, I want to talk about Trayvon Martin and the reaction here in New York City to the Trayvon Martin um, trial, the tri I guess the trial of Zimmerman, really. And uh, then we're going to talk about what's going on in California, which I think is so important because in California uh, there is actually a hunger strike going on in the prison system there, and we're going to talk more about how they run the prisons there in California and what's led to actually a hunger strike going on there throughout the state prison system in the state of California. Um, and there's a lot there as well. And uh, also, phone number's there, so uh, you feel free to call in, and we'll take your calls. And um, let's begin by talking a little bit about this stop and frisk situation, Jamel. All right, stop and frisk, is it, is it over now? Do you think that Judge Scheinland's decision is a victory? Or is it another uh, three-card Monty? What do you think? Well, I mean, it, it's funny because um, actually I've been getting a lot of different messages from friends, you know, messages of support and congratulations from the recent ruling um, mm -hmm. from friends, strangers, and acquaintances um, and people making posts. And I was just actually uh, joking with uh, my colleague and comrade Noche Diaz and thinking about, you know, how actually, you know, people are saying congratulations, but, w you know, we have to actually unpack why this case went to trial mm -hmm. and what were the conditions around what it is, what the reality of stop and frisk is and then what the decision in this case is. Mm -hmm. you know, the reality of stop and frisk and what it means to a whole section of black and Latino youth. Now, it's you bad know. reality to you. Have you been yeah. stopped and frisked? Oh yeah, you know, of, of course. You know, and this and is what part of the city do you, you come from? I actually, I live in Harlem, but mm -hmm. I actually was born in Washington, D.C. And this is part of a program you know, that of racial profiling that's across the nation. Mm -hmm. In D.C., they don't call it stop and frisk, but the same types of applications occur and the mm -hmm. same types of occurrences happen all the time. It's not just in New York. No, this is not just a New York phenomenon mm -hmm. where you're looking at as a, you know, as a policy of criminalizing black and Latino youth because this system actually has mm -hmm. no future for them. You've been involved. Uh, what is, just briefly, the Revolution Club Stop Mass Incarceration Network? Yeah. Pr provocative names. Revolution Club. A bunch yes. of people get together in a clubhouse talking about the revolution? <laughs> well, I mean... Well, in the Revolution Club, we, uh, we you know, kind of go by the ethos of fight the power and transform mm -hmm. the people for revolution. Sure. Um, so this isn't uh, kind of backdoor armchair stuff. You know, revolutionaries actually are looking at how, how do you actually prepare people right now, organizing thousands of people to lead millions of people in a transformed situation mm -hmm. where you could actually go all out for revolution. And you put your, uh, you put your body on the line. You've been arrested uh, twice. You said uh, to me earlier, uh, you've been arrested uh, in October 2011 at a nonviolent protest with Cornell West and Carl Dix. Carl's been on the show. I'd like to have Cornell West on. We can have him on sometime. And you were, another time you were arrested in Queens as well. well these are all protesting stop and frisk. Right. Tell yeah. me a little bit about what was the, the October 2011 arrest? What was that all about? Okay. I mean, well, these are arrests that went and again, this was from a campaign of nonviolent civil disobedience that was mm -hmm. began and initiated by Cornell West and Carl Dix. And, you know, again, you know, kind of ref looking back now at, at this, at with the ruling in this mm -hmm. decision has come down on. Sure. And knowing that the ground for this was actually stoked um, by mm -hmm. mass resistance that was injected sure. by, you know, the Stop Mass Incarceration Network and people who were willing to put their bodies on the line to protest this. I mean, the Center for Constitutional Rights, um, came to us in the, in the summer of 2011 before these actions. And they said, we have an airtight legal case on this around, you know, we have a Fourth Amendment argument, we have a Fourteenth Amendment argument. That's airtight. But this case will lose in court if there's not public support around it. And, and um, it was actually... Um, Why is that? Well, look, I mean, when you look historically about how these things actually occur in, in American history, you know, what was actually the difference between Plessy versus Ferguson and Brown versus Board of Education when you had the same nine Supreme Court justices ruling on the same decision? What it changed was actually public sentiment around the country. And it's the same thing. No, nothing is different today. And so it was actually, um, th again, the CCR and group organizations like the NYCLU had been in 
public suits for this for decades, or not for decades, but for years had been enmeshed in um, mm -hmm. legal formalities around this, but hadn't been able to make headway because there actually wasn't an edge of mass resistance around it. Right. And so that's where the Stop Mass Incar Incarceration Network was really congealed around these two, mm -hmm. uh, three actions sure. to protest stop and frisk at the places that had the highest incidence of stop and frisk in New York City, the 28th Precinct, the 77th in Brownsville, Brooklyn, and the 103rd out in Queens. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we have, I have a, a uh, statement from Mayor Bloomberg mm. uh, in re reaction to the judge's decision in this case. Pretty angry response. And it's, we have about two, two and a half minutes. We can go to it now. Let's play the mayor's response uh, that I have up on the computer in the control room and uh, see what, what he has to say. And then I Corporation want to Corporation Counsel Michael Cardozo. Every day, Commissioner Kelly and I wake up determined to keep New Yorkers safe and save lives. And our crime strategies and tools, including stop, question, frisk, have made New York City the safest big city in America. And I'm happy to say we are on pace for another record low of shootings and homicides this year because our police officers follow the law and follow the crime. They fight crime wherever crime is occurring. And they don't worry if their work doesn't match up to a census chart. As a result, today we have fewer guns, fewer shootings, and fewer homicides. In fact, murders are 50% below the level they were 12 years ago when we came into office, something no one thought possible back then. Stop question frisk, which the Supreme Court of the United States has found to be constitutional is an important part of that record of success. It has taken some 8,000 guns off the streets over the past decade and some 80,000 other weapons. As guns continue to flow onto our streets from other states, we have to take every constitutionally protected step at our disposal to keep them out and to keep them from being used to kill innocent people. Today, we have the lowest percentage of teenagers carrying guns of any major city across our country. And the possibility of being stopped by is, is, acts as a vital deterrent, which is critically important, by, which is a critically important byproduct of stop, question, frisk. The fact that fewer guns are on the street now shows that our efforts have been successful. And there is just no question that stop, question, frisk has saved countless lives. And we know that most of those lives saved, based on the statistics, have been black and Hispanic young men. It's worth remembering that as recently as 1990, New York City averaged more than six murders a day. Today, we've driven that down to less than one murder a day. Think about what that change really means. A murder, if murder rates over the last 11 years had been the same as the previous 11 years, more than 7,300 people who are alive today would be dead. Stop, question, frisk has helped us prevent those and other crimes <laughs> from occurring. Which has I wasn't about the mayor. I was giving a signal <laughs> to the guy. <laughs> our, our trusty engineer is a great guy. Um, all right, so... Um, Jamel Mims, uh, it's probably a little more than I wanted to play, but I think it's good that we got out his argument, because I think after that he just basically repeats it over and over again for the next 20 minutes. So tell us, there's the mayor saying 7,500 people would be dead today if it wasn't for stop and frisk. All right, look, we, we have to face facts and actually look at what stop and frisk is to hundreds of thousands of people in this city and what it actually is a part of. This is a part of a, po a series of programs that outline the contours of what is a system of mass incarceration, the new Jim Crow. What you're looking at is criminalizing whole sections of black and Latino youth, right? In New York City alone, they stop and frisk more black men than there actually are black men in New York City. So what, what actually is this and what actually do they do this for? I mean, at the essence, this is not, you know, and again, the mayor goes back to this false dichotomy that this is used to fight crime. By the NYPD's own statistics, all right, this is an incre e extremely inefficient means to remove weapons from the street. Now look, you know, there's far been far too much talk of this, you know, straight up, you know, dichotomy between violence among the people and the violence that the state 
enacts upon them. And in, in a lot of ways, the state uses that violence in order to justify bringing down the violence of the state from its police onto the people. And when we look at these, these are not separate phenomena. The same system pins and denies a whole section of people a future, pins them into conditions where they cannot thrive, where they have no jobs, no resources, no education, terrible schools, all right, where the only means of a legitimate, uh, any kind of a legitimate opportunity is through an illegitimate economy. And then on top of that, it sicks its police out onto them. I mean, you, what you're looking at are, are both, whether it's when you're talking about gun crime, whether it's the, you know, whether it's these youth out here who are, you know, killing one another or the police who are out here killing these youth every 38 hours, you know, then in either case, what you're looking at is the system taking the lives of these people and, and cording them off in conditions that are tantamount to a slow genocide. And, you know, kind of fundamentally, this is not about crime fighting or, or helping to keep a certain section of people, you know, uh, safe. What this is, is a policy of containment that actually pens them in and traps them into mm -hmm. conditions that are the most unsafe. Right, Jamel Mims. Uh, by the way, we are live and our number is there on the screen, 212-757-1541. If you have a comment or a question, feel free to call right in and join the conversation. I'm Paul DiRienzo and this is Let Them Talk, as you can see. And, um, okay, Jamel, Jam Jamel Mims of the Revolution Club, Club and Stop Mass Incarceration Network uh, says here you're a multimedia artist. Yes. What kind of multimedia do you do? We have, this is multimedia. Okay. Right? Yeah, this is a, a version of multimedia. I, I do, um, so the type of work that I do actually ranges from uh, visual art and do, uh, you know, uh, do a lot of photography uh, and video uh, and, and film and video installations. Don't tell me of police arresting and, and stopping and frisking and beating people and whatever things they do on the streets. Well, my video, well, the, the work that I've started to do actually is, you know, as I've actually grown more influenced by my politics, have the, the work has actually grown a lot more from uh, kind of following uh, where you know, my, uh, my kind of breakout work was uh, The Misadventures of Ting Budong, which is about hip hop in Beijing and street culture in Beijing, China. Really? Um, and Have you been to Beijing? Yeah, yeah, I lived there to do the, um, to complete the ethnography. Uh, you know, I'm fluent in Mandarin. I've lived in China for two years. Um, but, that, but that was kind of where I got my chops. But then in moving to New York City, uh, it, went, it went from kind of a background of participant observation to much more one of actually leading and creating social change through social transformation um, using street theater. Um, we've been doing this really, uh, or a couple of these pieces on um, around the prisoner's hunger strike that's going on in California right now, where mm -hmm. tens of thousands of prisoners are you know, risking their lives to protest the inhumane conditions of solitary confinement. Um, and we were doing a piece where I, I would dress up in an orange jumpsuit and do a chalk outline of uh, eight and a half by, um, or seven and a half by 11 foot uh, s uh, segregated housing unit or shoe cell uh, and pace back and forth. That's where um, they put people of the cell. in the California system. What in yeah. California, they've been, they have this quite developed system of punishing people for their associations, the gangs they yeah. are alleged to be. Gang injunctions. Right, and yeah. where they can actually separate them from the population for sometimes years at a time. Yeah, I mean, what, what are you looking at? I mean, and, and this happened in California where, you know, where we were talking about stop and frisk earlier, how yeah. here in New York is stop and frisk. In, in California, in a place like that, they have what's called gang injunctions. And in a gang injunction, they can, if that means if three or four youth are, are standing on the corner at one time, they constitute a gang and can be rounded up. And, um, mm -hmm detained, held, that can have their IDs held or scanned, sure. um, you know, similar to practices with stop and frisk. Now for, you know, that happens to whole sections of youth, tens and thousands of youth. Now, some of those youth who that happens to over and over again, you know, end up more or less living their lives enmeshed mm -hmm. in the snarling jaws of the criminal injustice system. And, a f you know, a fraction of those move on to places like the segregated housing units in the shoe. And in fact, right now, tens of thousands of people are held in solitary confinement mm -hmm. conditions, not just in California, but all over the country. Now, a section of inmates in California um, in the, at the Pelican Bay Prison, who two years ago mm -hmm. began a hunger strike to, um, to end these unjust and torturous conditions. I mean, what you're talking about is someone, just to paint the picture for you, someone being held in a tiny cell, eight and a half, you know, no, long, no, no larger than the studio being held in that cell for 23 out of 24 hours a day, um, being released from that, from that cell only for about an hour a day into a larger cage, um, and they call that recreation time or exercise. 
um, where they're denied human contact, there's sensory deprivation, um, where you're not spoken to. And we've heard stories of, uh, of an inmate who, once they had a visitor, the first visitor they had in months, and when they picked up the phone to, to the play glass, to the, um, through the play glass window. Yeah, to the play glass window to talk, um, they couldn't hear or understand the person on the other, on the other line. And this is, you know, this is From what... The psychological impact of oh, being in solitary. This has huge psychological impact where, in, where inmates have been held on this for days, for months, and for decades. You know, this can completely break down a human being. Is that and the idea behind it? And it seems to be, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. you know. And what has the response been in California, this hunger strike? Uh, what is, tell me a little bit of what, what's happening with this hunger strike. In, in, it was Pelican Bay Prison, right. I think they call it. What's happening? In, uh, are the prisoners just stri starving themselves? Are they going right. to die? Well, right now they're into their second month of the hunger strike. And this is, there's, there's already been one fatality uh, in this hunger strike. It's already claimed its first victim. Um, and, um, you know, the first day of the strike, actually, there were 30,000 inmates that joined it in California, which was more than, you know, two years prior, there was a strike, which was more than at the height of that strike. Have they been force feeding people and trying to force them to eat? Or? Uh, so far, there haven't been. You know, we've, we've heard quotes from prisoners that have said, each day has felt like torture, you know, and that many are willing to endure the, you know, w really endure to very, the very literal torture of, of being force fed if it has to come to that. But, but um, it hasn't happened yet, but it hasn't happened it's yet. possible. It is, yeah, it is very quite possible. Okay, interesting, California. Uh -huh. And, uh, well, wh do, tell us a little bit about the uh, Revolution Club, Stop Mass Incarceration Network. How can people get in touch with you, learn more, get involved? Well, people can check out the Stop Mass Incarceration Network at uh, www.stopmassincarceration.net. Um, one word. One word. Stop, Stop mass, mass incarceration. Incarceration. Dot yes. net. Right? Stop mass okay. incarceration. Dot net. Go. We said it three times at least. <laughs> you gotta. Get, all right. We want to make sure everybody has time to write it down. Right. Okay. Good. And um, and, and you're, you're building for what's uh, October twenty second. We always have shows around October twenty second, of course, uh, with Nicholas Hayward and others. Yes. Um, yeah. And uh, but uh, so October twenty second is well. Look at your T-shirt. Yep. The names. All right. right. Look, so we have Sean Bell, Amadou Diallo, Michael Stewart from My Neighborhood in Lower East Side, uh, Romarley Graham. Um, Romarley Graham. Oh, my gosh. Uh, what's, what's going on there? Yeah. Well, the, um, the, they've recently thrown out, the grand jury has recently thrown out an indictment against Richard Hayson and refused to. That was the policeman who the shot policeman him. Who followed shot. him into the house and yeah. shot him. Um, and, and on the basis that he was, the jury was not informed that police had told him there, that Romarley had a gun, which of course he did not. Right. I mean, and the, the I mean, the story was there was a the first time it was thrown out on, on a technicality, um, and then they decided to reconvene the grand jury. They were allowed to reconvene the grand jury since on the last case it was thrown out only because of a technicality, and now this time the grand jury has refused to uh, to, to actually serve the indictment against Richard Hayes. Yeah, there's an old saying. Um, I don't know if you've heard it, but from the old days, it's. Uh, a prosecutor can indict a ham sandwich in a grand jury. <laughs> 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 and, and so you would wonder, you know, they indict pretty much anybody they want to in that grand jury. Right. So if, they did, if nobody was indicted, they right. definitely weren't turning on the screws like they normally do. I mean, again, this was like a punch in the gut. When you look at this kind of, this, this cauldron of contradiction, this, this m maelstrom of, of maladies that have, you know, kind of been slapping people in the face through, throughout the summer. You have the verdict in the George Zimmerman trial right. um, that essentially has said that, look, we can murder your 17-year-old youth in the street and let their killers walk free and, uh, and r return their guns to them on the pretense that, you know, they're just simply, quote unquote, up, and up to no good. A similar verdict being handed down here in the case with, um, with the indictment against Richard Hayes being thrown out, um, saying again that you know the system saying yet again we have no future for this section of youth yet again these are these are youth that for th that the very best option for them you know mm -hmm. is to pin them up mm -hmm. and you hear again in this stop and first case yeah. where judge Sinlin, you know finds this unconstitutional but then what's you know but we, we need to actually you know get the full measure of, of her findings she finds it unconstitutional finds that this violates not only the the fourth and fourteenth amendment rights of uh, uh a whole section of, of black and Latino youth. Not only does, that, that does it have deep psychological ramifications for all those, but on top of all of that, you know, says that we won't end it. Mm -hmm. We just have to have some oversight for it. 
Well, we're talking about oversight from the same criminal injustice system that mass incarcerates 2.4 million people, keeps many of those pinned in solitary confinement, and that's you know yeah. overseeing the architecture of the new Jim Crow. And you're talking about appointing a, f we shouldn't wait for a federal monitor to be appointed from that criminal justice mm -hmm. system to come and try to rein this one in. Mm -hmm. um, well, I want to ask you what you mean by revolution, but mm -hmm. uh, let me segue to that yeah. by talking about, well, the, the Attorney General in Washington, mm -hmm. Holder, right. and, uh, you know, on behalf of President Obama, wants to redo the drug laws, wants to redo the mandatory minimums, reduce that, let more people out of jail. That is being touted in the New York Times and other places, along with Judge Shilin's decision, as a new a new dawn in America. We're moving away from the 70s and 80s uh, imprisonment mentality and moving towards a more, you know, uh, we're reducing the drug laws, marijuana is being legalized, uh, we're going to let people out of jail. We're generally going to, uh, uh, we have a black president, an attorney general who's seemingly sympathetic. Why shouldn't we have hope? Why should we have revolution? Well, look, I mean, if you think that these problems can be solved fundamentally by anything else than revolution, then I'd say, you know, you're kidding yourself. What you got to look at is the entire history of this country, that this country would not be the country that it is had it not been for the enslavement of African Americans and the genocide of Native Americans, and that being a basic and fundamental truth from which to move forward. When you we look did at fight the Civil War, a million people got killed. I mean, right, but then what happened after the Civil War? You had radical reconstruction. You had, you know, again, y the the yet again selling out of you know a whole section of black people who this system has no future for, from slavery to Jim Crow to the new Jim Crow. After the Civil War, you didn't have you know this. The country actually was given an opportunity to say, hey, we actually could, you know, the the rights that were afforded to this section of people, we actually could give those and ensure these rights. Mm -hmm. But but what happened? You actually had the abandonment of that entire section of people, radical reconstruction, and you actually had the rise of black codes, literacy tests, poll taxes, and... and coming back to with that, right. I mean, we're talking about... Exactly. We're and talking about literacy codes today and, and yeah. other poll taxes of a new sort, but pretty yeah. much affect same effect. Absolutely. I mean, and, and similarly, you had the civil rights movement that was a, you know, that again, people didn't, to people didn't make revolution during the civil rights movement. There were people, you know, there was a revolutionary sentiment in the air, right. but people didn't make full out revolution in the civil during the civil rights movement. You mentioned and what actually, you know, followed, just to again complete the point, right. what actually followed from that um, was, you know, the, the new Jim Crow, mass incarceration, the war on drugs, you know, guys like President Nixon saying the, the problem is the blacks, so you just need to figure out how to do something about that. And what actually got in, got in place was a system, you know, a policy, a series of policies, you know, from racial profiling and pipeline programs like Stop and Frisk all the way up into the mass incar drug right. laws and the Rockefeller drug laws and the uh, mm -hmm. mass incarceration of blacks and Latinos mm -hmm. all the way up through the 70s and 80s. Um, so where you have a situation like you have today where these vestiges, again, no matter if, no matter what the color or the party of whoever was leading that system, um, where they continue to replicate and even worsen the conditions. Right now we have more black people in prison, more black men in prison than there were slaves in 1850. We've, we're actually in conditions where that, that have actually worsened. Um, so this is not a time for, you know, if, if anything, you know, Things like this ruling where Judge Shinlin has said, this is clearly unconstitutional, but guess what? We can't end it. We'll have to figure out some way to oversee it. Well, what are they saying except for, we cannot assure the Constitution, even if we wanted to, we cannot assure the constitutional rights of, a, of, of this section of people. We recognize that it's unconstitutional, but we can't assure them. What else is it saying? But l barely and nakedly that this is a dictatorship, and what else does it deserve? What else is it but illegitimate? You know, it and can't actually be reformed or fixed. But what does a revolution mean? I mean, how does that count in this world today, mm -hmm. you know, with the, the, the massive force of America and its seeming stability, uh, how, uh, how is a revolution a realistic yeah. answer? Well, and just in the one minute answer, we don't have a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> the one, one minute revolution. The one minute revolution well, answer. Well, look, I, I invite you to come, to, you know, to invite me back to talk about this, but this is actually a, a large part of what people need to be digging into now and what moments like this around the, the verdict of, of Trayvon Martin, around, you know, what's, what's happened in the case of Ramarley Graham, around this recent decision by Judge Shinlin. What people need to start turning to is seeing the, the absolute illegitimacy and bankruptcy of this system. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, people need to be digging into the work of uh, this brother, Bob Avakian, who um, is the leader of the Revolutionary Communist Party and the revolution that I'm talking about. Um, that, you know, and that's the work of the, what the Revolution Club actually digs into and acts on in the world. Now, uh, uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, our Carl Dix, who's been on the show before, yeah. he'll be speaking. And that's uh, August 22nd. Yeah. Coming up in a few days, right? Yeah. At well, 7 p.m. at St. Mary's Church, which is 126th Street and Old Broadway. Yeah. <laughs> right? 126th Street in uh, Manhattanville, so folks up there know where that is. And uh, he's going to be talking about uh, this, the, that we don't need a new civil rights movement. Right. We don't need a new civil rights movement. We need a revolution. So we're not looking for the rise of a new Martin Luther King, but the rise of a revolutionary leader. And revolutionary leadership that, like the American Revolution, 1776. Russian well, Revolution, well, 1917? More akin to the Russian Revolution, 1917, or the uh -oh. 1949 Revolution of China and Mao Zedong. All right. Interesting. Um, last uh, two minutes, uh, sum up, maybe tell us a little bit about, you know, uh, what you think the next, the next step in all of this is going to be. Is, are people just going to be uh, watching what the police do now? Is there going to, do you know what's going to happen next or have some idea? Right. Well, I mean, that's a great question, and, and, and you know, again, I, I would reiterate getting with the Revolution Club and fighting the power and transforming the people for revolution. And just what do I mean by, fight, by, by those three sentences, fighting the power and transforming the people for revolution? Well, fighting the power means actually, you know, getting out around these injustices and, you know, um, joining with others to actually engage in struggle around them, you know, similarly to how we led struggle around uh, stop and frisk with the campaign of nonviolent civil disobedience. But people actually have to be transformed. People won't be as they are. You know, you actually have to transform and deepen our understanding of, of what the actual problem and what the actual solution is. Mm -hmm. But we can't just keep fighting back because people have been fighting back for decades, since the times of Jim Crow, since the times of the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, sure. What people actually need to be fighting back for what? For a revolution, for a way to actually get out of all of this. I mean, so, Again, with the Stop Mass Incarceration Network, folks are building towards making this year in October 22nd a huge, where massive October 22nd. Where, where can people will be out? How can people find out more? The the website. Well, people can check the website again. I said I'll drop it a fourth time. StopMassIncarceration.net. You can also s get linked up with the Revolution Club at. Um, and you can check us out on Twitter at at NYC Rev Club. Um, and you can also check us out on Tumblr at nycrevclub.tumblr.com. And do you meet pretty regularly and people get together and meet? I think yeah. I get emails every once in a while. Yeah, people get, to, people get together and meet regularly, but again, we are about actually... Mostly young people or is it it's about action? Oh, it's, it's, again, it's about fighting the power and transforming the people. So people, you Thank know, you we very get into much, the work Jamel and we get out in the streets. Thank you very much, for joining us on Let Them Talk. And we'll see you next week.